Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Part of God's word for our consideration this day is written for us in the last book of the Bible, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first chapter, verses eight, 4 through 18. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is coming, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his own blood and made us a kingdom and priests to God his Father, to him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. Look, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. And all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is coming, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingship and patient endurance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony about Jesus. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write what you see on a scroll and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands, was one like a son of man. He was clothed with a robe that reached to his feet, and around his chest he wore a gold sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool or like snow. His eyes were like blazing flames. His feet were like polished bronze being refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. He held seven stars in his right hand. A sharp, two-edged sword was coming out of his mouth. His face was shining as the sun shines in all its brightness. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I also hold the keys of death and hell. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Dear friends in Christ, I can't remember which came first because I was just a little kid back then. It was back in the 1970s. But I can't remember which came first. That common saying that people used to like to say, hang in there, baby, or that poster with the cat just barely hanging on by the one claw and this look on his face like, why me? And the caption underneath that said, hang in there, baby. But I do know it was a very common and very popular thing back then to have that poster or just to say those words. In fact, they even had more than 100 members of Congress write their names on that poster and give it to Spiro Agnew when he was deciding whether or not he was going to resign as vice president of the United States. Similarly, they gave a copy of that to Richard Nixon when he was going through that Watergate scandal. But then sometime after that, it became such a common thing that it was used more often instead of hang in there, life is tough. It was used more in the terms of, and that's what all the posters were after that. Same cat hanging there with that same look on his face. But then it always said after that, hang in there, baby, Friday's coming. Not quite of a, as grand of a, an idea, but we get the picture, right? Even those of us who don't necessarily get a break when the weekend comes, right, moms? We still under, understand that picture that, that, okay, there's kids in school and this time of year, man, it's starting to really hang out and they, they can't wait until Friday comes and, and that week is over for them or the way work piles up for us or just the frustrations and stresses and those kind of people that just suck the life out of our enjoyment for any kind of work we do. Yeah, it's nice to see that time come, whether it's a weekend or whatever time when we can relax and enjoy ourselves. And, and yet, for some, just that, cat hanging on there, hang in there, the weekend's coming or whatever. It's not just a, a clever little illustration. For some people, that is actually their life. Really, that's all they're about. I just got to get through this. I just got to get to Friday. I, the, the, the only reason that there are those 
five days there are the only reason I have to live through those. So I can get to those two days on the weekend, and then I can party, then I can relax. It's, it's just about that. And you'd think that that kind of an idea or lifestyle would go away as soon as someone becomes mature enough to recognize that there's always another Monday after that, right? And that that way of thinking really just makes life a, a meaningless rat race. And, and those, those little times of enjoyment and relaxation just kind of shows even more how meaningless the rest of it is. But there is really something grander, something that really can make it so that we can hang in there, baby, and not just from one weekend or one special occasion to the next either, but all the way through everything. No matter how anything is going, no matter what is happening or what is not happening in our lives, our God wants us to be able to see that there is something to look forward to, something to hold on to. In fact, something so good to hold on to that it holds on to us and keeps us there, not just till the next weekend, but for all of forever. And that's why he gave his apostle John and his church in general this thing that's called the Revelation the book we call Revelation, a series of visions that was meant to encourage and build up and strengthen those Christians so, so that they could hang in there. And I can see how it might have worked for those first century Christians. But man, this is the year 2021. The Apostle John did not have to deal with gas prices approaching $5 a gallon in Asia Minor. The Apostle John didn't have to pay insurance premiums and some bill to Xfinity or the internet service. And, and he didn't have to go from orthodontist to dentist appointment to, to colonoscopy to, to skin check. And, and, and he didn't have to struggle with, with constant traffic and, and bad news. And, and his email account wasn't filled up with all these things that, that, that people had for him to have to do sometime that week. And, he didn't have a, a worry about saving for a college fund or some type of a retirement account. He didn't have to worry if, if the government was going to run out of money before, before they paid him all his Social Security checks or not. He didn't have to worry about things like China and ISIS and the Taliban and COVID and cancer. So, yeah, sure, this revelation stuff, this, this vision from God, yeah, that could help a first century person like John, who all he had to go through was his brother and best friend James getting his head chopped off for telling the same message about Jesus that John was preaching. Or his other good friend Peter being interrogated and tortured and executed by the government forces for his religious beliefs or living under the regime of this kind of good guy emperor. Nero, you heard of him? And the way he used the government and the military to oppress God's people and God's church. And the way people in John's congregation were having their properties confiscated, having members of their family thrown into prison, having other members of their family being executed, how John's entire ethnic group had their entire country devastated by a military invasion that completely wiped out the whole place, that place where he had come from. Gone completely. Famines, plagues, earthquakes, higher and higher taxes paying for these, uh, these social programs and then just hobbies of the, the emperor and then this new emperor coming along Domitian that made the old guy Nero look like, like Mary Poppins or something in comparison. The infringement of his rights. The lack of freedom to worship. The lack of due process under law. And then now this 90-some year old Christian is sent to this penal colony island, Patmos. A little bit smaller than Catalina about the topography of the moon the Alcatraz of Asia Minor. Oh, and those were just some of the concerns. He also had, he was like the circuit pastor for this group of seven congregations in Asia Minor. Now he's separated from them. And as he's separated from them and knows all the people in these churches, then Jesus comes and tells him he has to 
write some letters to kind of scold some of these people, talking about some of the things that they didn't want to hear about, but things that God said were going to be things that they needed to hear about and we need to hear about because these are things that are representative of all his churches in all times. So now John has Jesus tell him he has to write this letter to his favorite church, Ephesus, and say, remember the state from which you have fallen, repent, or I will come to you and remove your lampstand, your church, from its place. They had been a strong congregation. They loved Jesus, and they loved to reach out with Jesus' word, but they had gone, gone cold over time, and now they were going downhill. Or that little church in Smyrna, like, how are they possibly going to hang on with so many of their people being arrested and persecuted, and so many of their older Christians are, are just either leaving or are, are dying, passing on? How, how's that church ever, ever going to make it? Or Pergamum, where they had kind of the modern idea that, you know what, we don't want to stick out as being Christians. We're going to kind of accommodate ourselves to the, the people around us. We're going to try to make ourselves look more and more like the society around us. And yeah, that might mean having to compromise some of our beliefs, some of the truths of God's word. And then God has him write this letter that makes it sound like God's not really big on this kind of ecumenicism. And he says, I know where you live, where the throne of Satan is. So I guess he didn't appreciate their idea. And then that, that Thyatira, that was the, the congregation everybody wanted to transfer to because they had the more impressive uh, worship services and all these programs, and they were bustling with activity. But, but again, they weren't holding true to God's word. So what good was any of that? And then at Sardis, another congregation, oh yeah, they had been a really good and going congregation at the beginning, and they had grown for a while, but they were really tapering off, and they were to the point where God's word says that, yeah, they kind of loved in a way where they loved each other, the people in this tight little circle, but not so much the people outside. And so it was going downhill more and more, the same as this church in, in Philadelphia, and again, how could they hold up? as their numbers were dwindling. And then this last one, Laodicea, oh my goodness, Jesus says, I know you are neither cold nor hot. If only you could be cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Indifference? Complacent? Lackadaisical about God and the truth of his word? And John's just got to be be shaking his head, and this is on top of all those other things that are going on, and this is just the right now, because in Revelation, he gets to see more about the future, and what does God say about the future? Oh, don't worry, it's going to be a lot brighter, it's going to be a lot easier. No, he says, don't worry, it's going to get a lot worse. There are going to be more and more anti-Christian influences in governments and societies. There's even going to be an anti-Christ himself who appears within the church of God and uses the church of God as his headquarter to, to be against Jesus by teaching people the lie that they can be their own gods. They can work their own way into God's good graces and into his heaven. False teachings, battles, spiritual warfare. This is some scary looking stuff. Okay, okay, maybe John did have as much to be concerned about as as we do. Maybe John could uh, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with us in a pity party and feeling sorry for us ourselves. Maybe he did have as many struggles and problems and difficulties in life, but not probably for sure. For sure, the assurances God gives him are the assurances he gives us. As he says, hang in there because Jesus is coming. And not just barely hang in there. This part of Revelation sums up what what really all of Revelation is about, as, as Jesus had kind of introduced it in John chapter 16, saying, in this world, you are going to have trouble, but be courageous, for I have overcome the world. Oh, so there isn't any promises here that if you follow Jesus, you're going to have an easy life? If you believe hard enough, your health is going to get better and people are going to like you more and you're going to be more and more successful. Did John not have that channel on his TV? 
Did he not have that channel where the, the preachers say, name it and claim it, and, and if you do this and you believe hard enough, everything's going to be going right and bright, shiny, and you're going to have all only warm and fuzzies all the time? Did he not have that on his TV, or did he not have that in his holy scriptures? Did he not have that in his God's word and promises? Would it be kind of weird if one of those televangelists said, send in your hundred dollars so that you can suffer and be persecuted and, and need all kinds of endurance to be along with Jesus? Well, it's not only weird, God actually says it right here. He starts off in verse 9, says, I, John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and patient endurance of Jesus. Sign up for this. Suffering and patient endurance. But there's more. He says, yeah, you're going to have it rough, but you're also going to have something you can hold on to. Something you can side up on. Something that's going to hold on to you. I have overcome the world, he says. Or right here, grace to you and peace from the one who is, who was, and who is coming. Jesus Christ, the ruler of the kings of the earth. For I am the living one. There was a, a Lutheran preacher. His name was Lloyd Douglas. He wrote a book called The Robe. Maybe you've seen the movie on TV. That's from, it's an old movie from the 50s. But they usually have it on sometime during Lent. It's a really good story. Watch it sometime. It's, it's pretty good. But anyway, this, this uh, Pastor Douglas, when he was going to the seminary, he was living in a boarding home where one of the, the people also that was living there was this old uh, retired music teacher. And he couldn't do anything. He, he could only sit there in his wheelchair all day. So pastor, wasn't pastor yet, but Lloyd would bring him his lunches up on a tray and sit and talk with him every day. And every day he'd come in and he'd say, so what's the good news, teacher? And the teacher would say this, and he'd, he'd always pull out this tuning fork out of, his, out of his shirt pocket. He always had it there, night or day. And he'd hit it on the side of his wheelchair and he'd go, listen to that. That's middle C. 500 years ago, that was middle C. Right now, this is middle C. A thousand years from now, this will be middle C. I, I can count on this. That, that tenor singing across the hall in the shower, that guy's flat. The piano in the rec room, that's way out of tune. But this, my friend, this, my friend, is, is middle C. And, and this guy was always so happy because he had one thing in life he could count on no matter what, right? You and I have the middle C in life that we can always count on. Only our middle C is what? Christ. Christ, the unchanging one, the one who always is and was and always will be. True God, beginning, no beginning, no end. Alpha and the Omega, I am the living one. I was dead and now I am alive forever and ever. And that is so important to know because there's a lot of places in Revelation, the rest of the Bible that talk about the second death, the lake of fire, eternal damnation, places, terms for hell where everyone would have ended up if it weren't for this Jesus the Christ. This son of God who became man and he was dead. He was crucified and now he's alive. As Paul writes to the Romans, he was delivered over to death because of our trespasses, our sins, and was raised to life because of our justification. Every speck of our guilt, all the dirt of our sin, every blemish of going against God's will or law in our attitudes, our actions, our words, every time we passed up an instance to, to be able to help someone out or, or do something nice for someone else, Jesus gave himself into death for all of that. Jesus, true God, true man from all, he died for us. God, God's son died on the cross. Do you think that's a high enough price, certainly expensive enough to do what he tells us it does in John's other writing when he says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us for all sins. From, for he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the whole world. And to prove it, he rose from the dead. He was triumphant. He, he destroyed all, all the enemies. Sin was conquered completely by Jesus' full and complete payment on the cross. The, the hell and its gates and all its, its, its regions were just left in shambles as we're told Jesus marched triumphantly over Satan and hell and death, that fearsome enemy, 
disintegrated as Jesus walked out the other side that first Easter morning. So he says, don't be afraid. I am the living one. I'm alive forever and ever. And that's what you and I have to hold on, to hang on forever and ever, to hang on, to, that holds on to us no matter what. We have a Savior who did everything it took to get us into God's family, to make us right with the Almighty God, to give us forgiveness and eternal life forever. A Savior who still does everything it takes to get us all the way to the end. As it says in Romans 8, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We've got Christ Jesus our Lord. That means we have everything. Everything, not the just for forever, as if I can say just for forever, as if the eternal life stuff isn't already glorious enough to be excited about for now. But even the for right now stuff, the true joy and the peace with God and then the peace of conscience and, and the confidence and the happiness of, of knowing that everything we could possibly want is right there in Jesus. This Jesus who won such a glorious victory and now gives it to us so we can't lose. Like the little drummer boy in the Napoleon army back in the Napoleonic Wars, you know, the drummers were like 11, 12 years old. And so this kid was a drummer in Napoleon's army, and he had never seen them lose before. Until once they were losing, and a commanding officer gave him the order to beat out the, the signal for retreat on his drums. And the kid says, I'm sorry, sir, I don't know that one. Uh, I, I can beat a charge that will make the dead drop into line and, and fight their hardest, but I've used it in the past, and, and it's... We've won all those fights before, and the commanding officer says, okay, and the little boy beats the charge, and they won a glorious victory today. That's us. That's what we have in Jesus, this Christ, this, this one who lets us know we can't lose. We can only win. We have this glorious victory in this crucified and risen Jesus who is, is our Savior, our King, no matter what. It makes it so we can't lose no matter what. Whether it's Friday or Monday or whatever, whatever day it is, whatever's going on, whatever's not going on, we know that we can hang in there, baby. Well, not just hang in there. We can actually enjoy it. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having listened to the word of our holy God, we now have the opportunity to declare and confess the faith that he has given us. We do that this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. Would you please stand? We believe in one Lord, God, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.